Hi, I'm Polly Jean Harrison, and we are here at Money 2020 in Las Vegas. Would you like to introduce yourself for us, please? Certainly. My name is Jeff Cronin. I'm with Zenwork. Uh, I'm the chief strategy officer there. I actually joined the business only 90 days ago. Uh, we are really focused on regulatory compliance for money transfers and asset transfers. And so uh, you know, here we're talking a lot about identity verification for uh, businesses as opposed to individuals, not know your customer, but know your business, uh, as well as the upcoming regulatory reporting on digital asset transfers and crypto exchanges uh, from the Internal Revenue Service. It's, part of, it's actually a part of the Build Back Better plan. Amazing, I mean, yeah. 90 days, that's, uh, that's uh, not a very long time at all. How are you finding it so far? <laughs> uh, it's been great. I, I've got a history in the business. I was actually uh, GM of the US tax business for serverless compliance prior to joining. And so this is really a return to a business that I've been working with and working around for many years. And so it's really exciting to get back in to the regulatory compliance space and sort of GRC in mm -hmm. general and help businesses you know, deal with their compliance obligations as effectively as possible. Absolutely. And I guess coming at it from with your experience and your history, what kind of exciting changes do you see uh, coming up in this space? And I suppose what concerning changes do you see as well? Yeah, you know, a lot of the, the regulatory compliance side around government regulation of activity is, is it's been going around for a long time. Uh, about once every 10 years, a government will give you a brand new set of regulations you have to deal with. And what we've seen with crypto is we've seen, you know, as that asset class has grown, government's now starting to pay attention to it. So we're starting to see a whole new set of regulatory frameworks around how do you deal with crypto transfers, uh, gains, losses, mm -hmm. taxability, and that kind of stuff. And that's really an, it's a really an exciting opportunity. The last time this happened in the US was cost basis reporting on sales of securities. And that increased the regulatory burden um, literally eightfold in the brokerage space. Mm -hmm. And we're expecting to see that really show up in the, the crypto, especially the crypto exchange space. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a huge change for everybody. Uh, and you know, how do people prepare for it, right? What's Coinbase gonna do in the US? That's gonna be a big question. Right, for sure. And I, I know you, you've talked a lot previously about how, you know, current events and previous sure. events that are recent years have forced regulators to really start thinking about this sort of thing when we think about digital assets. I'd love it if you could give us a couple of examples for this. And also, why is it that the regulators are looking for the changes? Sure. Uh, well, the, the main reason the regulators are looking for the changes is money. Um, right. So uh, if you look at the Build Back Better plan that was signed by the Biden administration in December last year, the only revenue offset in that plan to cover the expenditures was actually a tax was actually a, an implementation of a set of mm -hmm. regulations to tax digital asset transfers. Uh, IRS thinks that's forty seven billion dollars a year um, in terms of opportunity for tax gain. Right. And so that's really the reason that you see the regulators going after us and saying, hey, you know, there's a bunch of wealth being generated that is currently going without tax. And you know the big problem for a lot of folks in this space is you know we've operated like like those assets were physical commodities, like they were gold or like they were cash. Mm -hmm. Well, like it or not, governments aren't viewing it that way. And so when they, you know, they're gonna wanna know how much, you know, you bought it for X, you sold it for Y, how much was your cat, was your gain, and how mm -hmm. do I get the tax on that gain? And that's really what we see driving a bunch of that activity. It's really about the government's waking up and saying, hey, there's a bunch of economic activity going on here that's going below the tax radar. How is it that we make sure that the government gets their cut on it? You're going to have some big problems that come from that. Uh, most of us in the space haven't been actually doing identity verification for our investors, and so we don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. We know we know we know who they are, but we don't know who their tax entity is. We don't know who their taxing authority is. We don't know if they're on a sanctions list. All of those things are going to start coming into play with the new regulations. Absolutely, I guess. We talk about building back better a lot, and I know you've yeah. talked about that very much previously. How does that apply when we think about the regulators, but also about you know the cryptocurrency, the traders themselves? Well, I mean, the idea for for this is that you know, one, we sort of as an industry have to embrace the fact that the regulators are coming, and then two, how is it that we build a platform that automates transparently all this activity? Mm -hmm. Somebody setting up their their trading account on a crypto exchange is going to want to wait three days for their account to get approved because they're waiting for a government agency to verify that they are who they are. We need to, as a community of technologists, build a technology platform that allows that to be done in real time anywhere in the world. Uh, there are a lot of challenges there and a lot of individual governments don't make it easy, but I think that's a challenge that we can rise to and we can actually overcome. 
Absolutely. And I think a lot of the time at the moment I'm hearing when we think about digital assets, there's the, either the opportunity to think about them as a security or a commodity or sometimes both. Yep. Can you talk us through kind of the differences between those, but also the differences when it comes to A, the regulation and B, the traders themselves? How would that work? Yeah. So when you look at the, you know, if they're, if they're regulated as a commodity, um, you're actually going to get the information reported to the government based on the gr total value of the transfer of the asset. Right. So. Um, right now, for example, you know, the U.S. government is leaning toward Bitcoin being treated as a commodity, which means that when you transfer Bitcoin from one place to another, you just have to tell the government how much you transferred. Right. Now, for those of us who have multiple wallets, that means we transfer Bitcoin between our own wallets. We're gonna, there's a government reporting obligation that's going to happen. <laughs> and I, you know, I moved you know, three Bitcoin from wallet A to wallet B. Well, that's going to need to go to the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, but if it's regulated as a security, then it's treated like a stock like a regular, you know, a, a traditional security. So I'm going to have a, I'm going to buy it for X, that becomes my cost basis, and then I sell it for Y. That's a straightforward story. Very few of us who are trading digital assets are buying one lot at a time and selling one lot at a time. And so you'll end up in a situation where I, you know, if I've accumulated my three Bitcoin over the course of two years with a whole bunch of small transactions, each of those small transactions will have to get reported to the IRS. And mm -hmm. so, you know, how do we take all of that headache away from the individual and how do we handle it for them on the exchanges, in the technology platforms and deal with that transparently and, you know, let the let people invest the way they need to invest and try to, you know, better their economic situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess, are there any precedents in previous sort of history when we, that we can apply when thinking about legislation for digital assets? Yeah, the, um, the most recent change or completely new set of regulations that we saw, um, you saw a whole bunch of foreign account compliance regulations that right. came, into a, came, came into existence, sort of around the, you know, you know the whole bunch of offshore account scandals that happened. Uh, and that ended up with a worldwide set of regulatory regimes, whether it, you know, you know, there's a set of regulations in in the World Bank instituted, predominantly run out of Europe. Uh, UK had their own, US had FATCA. Um, and so you look at the various tax compliance obligations that came up out of that, and you really, you know, that really focused on the large investment institutions and the Swiss banks, because they were the ones who were causing the biggest problem. Um, <laughs> and so as we started expanding that regulatory framework, you know, you really had to build up an entirely new set of skills to identify you know, whether or not the individual that's holding your account, um, are they sanctioned? Are they getting, is that tax being reported to the right regulator? Unfortunately, for those of you who are not used to US tax regulations in the US, no matter where your income is sourced, you're always taxed in the US. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if I've got foreign assets and I'll, uh, you know, in Isle Man, I got foreign assets in Bermuda, I got foreign assets in Cayman, all of that information has to get swung back to the US Internal Revenue Service. Right. And none of those banks or financial institutions are used to doing that work. Mm -hmm. And so when that all came into account, there's a whole group of players uh, who came into existence just to help them do that. because they don't really want to have to handle, deal with that headache. In your country, if I'm just dealing with, you know, customs revenue excise in the UK, that's easy because I've got one regulator to deal with. But if I'm, you know, if I'm Barclays, I've got to do it in at least four countries. And so following on from that, what kind of risks are going to be involved with this for the exchanges when we think about the upcoming regulations? Uh, uh, so factually, what's likely to happen is you're going to end up with each regulator will institute their own penalty program uh, for you know, for the exchanges, for the for the, in, the entity they hold responsible, probably going to be the exchanges. Some kinds of the wallets, um, they'll waive them all in the first year. <laughs> the reality is that in you know in past experience, if past experience is a guide, they'll build up an entirely entire set of very scary looking compliance restrictions and penalty programs, and then they will waive it if you make any attempt to comply in the first year because they know we're all going to be sitting in a situation where. We, we don't have the data or the processes in right. place to comply in that in that short period short period of time. So um, in reality, you have to do something in 2023 and you probably can get away with not being good at it until 2024. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's yeah. really great to chat to you about this. Thank you.